two, one. <laughs> Welcome everyone, wherever you're joining in from today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, super stoked to present this episode of the Freedom Series live stream with you. We've got Sammy Yeager on the line. Uh, Sammy helps visionaries turn their big ideas into plans so the world can be filled with successful entrepreneurs who are doing great things. And more recently, uh, Sammy's been playing around with an organization or a business called the Fuel Collective which is on a mission to empower couples to create thriving relationships because with better relationships, we can create a better world. Sammy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so stoked to have you here uh, because I know that there, there's going to be a lot of gold that's discussed and dropped on today's show. So what I'd say is if you are watching this live uh, or on a replay, please start a watch party, uh, bring others in on, around the campfire and the conversation, hit the like button and also throughout uh, the next half an hour, 40 minutes, please post your comments Below, my team's monitoring the chat uh, on all different platforms and we'll feed the questions back through to myself and Semi. Semi, where did this whole like empowering, inspiring, uh, unlocking visionaries start for you? So I had the opportunity to work um, in a business that was running um, the entrepreneur operating system in their business. So that's how yeah. they were living, breathing day to day. And I, um, I grew a lot in the time that I was working in that business. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar, it's uh, the entrepreneur operating system is um, the brainchild of Gino Wickman. It's from yeah. the book Traction. Yeah. Um, and through working in that business, I got exposed to this, I guess, this way of thinking. Mm. Um, and from there, um, I read the second book, which is um, or one of the other collection of, from that library, um, Rocket Fuel, which one talks- favourites. Yeah, it's one of the yeah. best books. And it literally like changed my life. And I probably only read the book like 18 months into um, working in that business. So I was, you know, quite familiar with the the methodology and the ideas. But um, yeah, reading Rocket Fuel, it unpacks this idea that there's kind of two primary um, forces, this relationship between a visionary and an integrator and that they're both unique and special in their skill set and they actually need each other and it's quite okay that you're one and not the other and mm. it's that you know it's that dynamic duo when you know paired together creates rocket fuel for a business mm. um, and i guess reading that book and having all these pennies drop and being like that's me that's me that's me that's me i guess just empowered me to be like this is who I am. This is how, you know, these are the, the skills and the strengths that I have. Why not lean into that? Yeah. It's really interesting too. Like that, that's one of my favorite books from all time, Rocket Fuel, absolutely. And if you guys haven't checked out the episode, I recorded yeah. an episode a few days ago with Heather Disher, who's actually my integrator uh, for one of my businesses, The Game Changers. And we touch on probably a little bit differently to what me and Sammy are going to speak about because we touch on the actual working relationship, relationship between me and her. But it's interesting too, because I've met a lot of implanters or integrators that have had this bit of a complex around, oh, like, but I want to be the front person or, but I want to have some stage time. Or there's an aspect of like, am I, am I, am I good enough or am I good being in this position, not fully owning the power that they have as implementer? Because both roles, as you said before, both are equal and both uh, when combined create rocket fuel in the business. No one I think is any better than the other. And in actual fact, one without the other is not very good at all. So can you speak a little bit about how like your process and I guess your identity may have been affected in you when you started to realize, hey, this is my role. Like maybe I'm not a visionary, but that's okay. I'm equally as powerful in my role mm. as an implementer. Yeah, I mean, I my background before I had that realization was in events, like as a, a project manager and event manager. And a lot of my career was around um, creating the space to showcase other people and mm. their capabilities. So that that piece probably wasn't, like I didn't have a lot of ego to work through in mm. terms of um, giving way to other people. It was more embracing um, that the, that what I have and what I hold is actually very valuable. Yes. It was more that that I had to sort of go, oh, fuck, like not everybody, sorry, I'm dropping the F-bombs. Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, cool. Not everybody thinks the way that I think. And mm. it was probably more that realisation that, hey, there's all these incredible visionaries and it's we need them. Like we need them for the, the big ideas and what is the world going to look like in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, you know, the future. We need those people to, to, to have that lane and, and think that big. But it's really hard for them to change gears and think about, well, what are the first 10 
20, 30, 40, 50 steps that I need to take to make that happen. And it was really empowering for me to realize that, oh, I think about those first 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 steps. I might struggle to think about the, you know, the flying cars and, um, you know, total disruption of industry, but I can think about things in a way that doesn't come naturally to other people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I think there's such a powerful experience and dynamic that can be created when a visionary gets a business to a position where it's like, okay, I now need someone to sit between me and the team. I've reached a level that that I'm able to reach within myself and within my current level of capacity, but I'm now at a point where I'm I'm creating as much chaos as I am, you know, success in the business. And that's when that integrated role can be really Mm. empowering to, I guess, unlock the visionary to play in their sweet spot, to to play in that realm of, creating ideas and something I spoke with uh, Ray Blakeney about on a previous live stream episode, not too long ago as well, is the two types of entrepreneurs, the ones that create up and think about the flying cars versus those that just simply see problems that currently exist and fix them. Mm. You know, like, like, Oh, uh, I've got this current problem. He was mentioning, you know, about uh, wanting to search who runs what podcasts and what podcasts can I get on. There wasn't a platform like that that exists. So he's essentially made the Google for podcasting. We can yeah, jump cool. on this platform and search up and find every single podcast that's spoken about relationships or around mindset, and it provides their contact details in a way to connect with them. Now, that hasn't come from the, the flying car innovation. It's just come from having him having a problem and going, I can fix that problem. Mm, yeah, which is so powerful too because some people don't take that step in terms of identifying a problem that they experience in the day-to-day life and go well what would a solution look like they just live with the problem so that's where that visionary thing steps in because they go okay well if I'm having this problem I'm sure that there are others who are having that problem but that's not a default way of thinking for everybody and that's that's kind of what that you know that visionary integrator kind of idea comes from right it's like we need both people yeah to see the problems and go there's probably a better way to do this yeah and if you look at some of the most successful companies in the world, they all have this dynamic playing out. It's just often you're not aware of it because mm. the front man is Steve Jobs, right? Or it is Walt Disney. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, you don't necessarily hear that there's someone in the background that's equally as important that's basically helping to create order from chaos in the, in the back end of things. Mm. Um, I think you said a really important thing as well. I know it's something that touch, touches my heart for my own personal journey, and that's kind of owning, owning the strengths that you bring forth to the table. And I see a lot with people that we work with at the game changers and people that I just even friends and people I interact with is that people shy away from owning who, all of who they are. Mm. There's almost this, this um, concept where they believe that these aspects of themselves are good or these aspects should be shared and shown. These aspects are not good and shouldn't be shown. And someone put it beautifully in a, in a previous episode as well, that many ways we're comparing our behind the scenes to somebody else's highlight reel, you know, on social media, like, has it been something where you've always kind of owned who you are and, and who you feel you're here to be in the world? Or is that something that you felt has kind of developed and, and worked through as you've improved your mindset, as you've kind of grown in business? Yeah, I think that, that it's definitely something that I've had to work on and continue to work on. Um, like you kind of said earlier, I, you know, I dropped a podcast at the beginning or a t- couple of months ago now, but that took a lot. Like it was like, okay, we're going to launch it in January now we're going to launch it in February. Okay, now we're going to launch it in March. And I think a lot of that time was me getting in my own way because I'm, I've am i launched this podcast in this relationship sort of space and I'm not the expert and I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a coach, I'm not a therapist, but I did want to create a space to have those conversations. Mm. So I think, you know, going inward and going, okay, well, what? why am I getting in my own way here? What's happening? Um, you know, going, uh, okay, just own that this is something that you want to have conversations about. This is something that you have this much experience about. There is always going to be somebody who's got more. They're going to have more qualifications. They're going to have more experience. They're going to have had more, um, you know, or, or different types of experiences, but that would be the case for everything. Yeah. So just start, like just get okay with it. And it might feel uncomfortable, lean into that discomfort it's like that the obstacle is the, is way. the way yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah ryan holiday's book fantastic book and I, I love that about leaning into it and you're right there's always going to be someone that maybe knows more than you in a particular area but they're not you yeah and this is the thing that i think is really interesting is that 
until we actually take off the facade of trying to be someone we're not, because let's be honest, like we've all had experiences through our life and maybe some of you guys are still there right now where you're wearing this facade and it might be unconsciously, but you're wearing a facade because you want to fit in. You want to belong. You want people to recognize you or to be proud of you or, you know, to, to follow you, whatever the case may be. I honestly feel though that the power is in the vulnerability. And it's yeah. once we take off that facade and we start to actually own all of who we are, then we're living an authentic and genuine life. Then we can actually attract the tribe that resonate with who we are, our goods, our bads, our, our quirks, uh, all the different qualities that we have as a human being, but we can't attract that genuine tribe until we first show up in a place of being authentic and genuine. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think um, that doesn't come naturally. I think that no, that's something God, no. that, that, you know, we're kind of groomed that we need to behave a certain way in public and we need to, you know, have a certain personal presentation and we need to, yeah, interact in a certain way. And, you know, that is appropriate to say in that situation. That's not appropriate to say in that situation. Like we're very heavily groomed into, you know, you know, you watch kids and they just are, they don't, they don't have this awareness of, you know, fitting into a particular type of box. If they see a fat person, they say, Oh mommy, that person's fat. Like they have no filter. And we've been, you know, I think being able to show up, fully authentically, maybe still having some awareness about what might be hurtful. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, unpacking like um, a, a mentor of mine has made a pledge to herself recently that she was going to stop um, showing up for her keynote speaking gigs in high heels. She's like, I just, I don't like wearing them. It's uncomfortable. And I'm doing it because other people think that that's what a keynote speaker should be doing as a woman. Yeah. And when she shared that story, I was like, well, hold on a second. Am I showing up how I want to show up or am I showing up how I think that other people want me to show up? Like, and that's, that's pretty like, you know, powerful when you start to think about um, and, and question yourself in terms of, well, is this, is this me or is this a version of me that I think that I should be? Yeah. Yeah. I was having a giggle there because I used to do this thing, like, as, as you know, every quarter we run events for our members and um, any members that are watching this right now would know that this is the case, whether they've realized it before, they're about to realize it. But on the first day, I'd always rock up wearing some chinos and a suit jacket and nice shoes. The second day, I'm thongs and shorts and a shirt. <laughs> but that's and probably who you are, right? Like the surfing entrepreneur who's just a bit chill. Yeah, super, super chilled. Um, but the interesting thing was, is that I remember someone sharing with me and I, I still remember it going through my head, like the day before I, that, that first event and I rock on stage, it's like, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like wrought at the system by going, well, I can make an amazing first impression <laughs> and then I can do whatever the fuck I want thereafter. Um, but now it's moved to just showing up, doing whatever the hell I want anyway. Yeah. And a couple of things I want to touch on, like you mentioned one thing about um, saying things that are hurtful. Here's the thing, um, there's obviously going out and consciously saying hurtful things, but then I also think a lot of people sit on uh, not sharing what their truth is because they're afraid or worried of the reactions they'll create. Mm. But I think yeah. like, like, do you actually give a shit enough about somebody to be genuine with them, to tell them what's up? Because I think the best relationships are formed through overcoming adversity together and challenge together. If you ever show up to your friend and be like, you know what, you got some shit in your teeth. Or you know what, like, like what I noticed, you say that you want to attract guys but yet you just emasculate them. But your behavior is someone. showing otherwise. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Let's I love it a that. bit. I love it a bit, but I've got to point this out because maybe no one else ever has and maybe mm. not even aware of it. Now yeah. it's up to them how they react to that, but I'd rather show up being fully uh, sharing everything that's, that's there for me rather than kind of like choosing which bits to share and which bits not in case they don't want to be friends with me anymore. Mm. And I think that's a, a depth of both authenticity and vulnerability because something that I learned, it was, you know, from digging into all of Brene Brown's books is that you can't expect to get vulnerability from your relationships if you're not willing to give it. And yeah. sometimes you have to be willing to go first. You have to be willing to have Absolutely. one of those awkward, deep conversations with, you know, a mate or, um, you know, your partner or a teammate or a client or whatever the, the situation is. But mm. somebody has to take it to that new depth first somebody yeah. has to be brave enough to do that and that is about that you know that being really authentic and leading with love in those conversations that might not be you know quote unquote easy yeah yeah 
Uh, yeah, God. There's so much I want to say around this topic and we're about to get in a rabbit hole. Um, before we do, we've got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, if you're watching live, welcome. Thanks so much for being here um, with the amazing Sammy. Uh, Lee from Adelaide, what would your top three money or an investment advice be for people who want to prepare for what's ahead, whether it be any sort of economic downturn or pandemic? Out of curiosity, what would, what would be your investment or money advice is that, a, is that a question for me or is that a question yeah. for you? Okay, you. For, me, for me, I am probably not the best person to answer questions about money. But what I do <laughs> know about money is that you get rewarded for the value that you are able to provide. Yeah. Um, so if you can become highly valuable and deliver, you know, ret you know return on investment, you can be paid more to do so yeah. um and i think you know those that investment piece um that looks different for everybody um my I, i've got a few people that i really love in this space who would give far better and more insightful advice than than me one is um the purpose academy um these guys harry and tristan uh dig into you as a human being and what is going to make you happy buying the house or the investment property or stocks or shares or whatever the, the, the vehicle to creating wealth, they will help you figure out what is most in line with you and who you truly are. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if that's a roundabout way to answer the question, yeah. but it's a bit of a handball to someone who's far more equipped to answer it than yeah. me. <laughs> and, it, and it's a fairly challenging question to answer, not knowing the financial situation. Um, yeah. Like obviously neither is a financial advisors, like, it's, 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 it's been a, and it is a great time to buy property, providing that you're buying it within the top 100 suburbs, a high mm. growth area, the, you know, property at the back of economy always does very well. We're at an early stages of going into, um, you know, financial recession. And as, as, as I said, like at the back of financial recession, property typically performs well. But that being said, do you want to have your money tied up in this time? Like, I think there's no better time than right now to invest in your business, provided that you do have a, a, a business that is profitable and, you know, you have an ambition to grow it to a point where it can work without you because before that, you've just got a job. Now, that yeah. being said, watch yesterday's episode with Michael McNeish. We talk about how regardless of the current economic downturn or the pandemic, it's like the, the, the simple principles of marketing and sales haven't changed. You know, we had so many clients that made more money and their businesses grew more during the pandemic and weekly too, like I met a lot of people, my sales team met a lot of people on the phones whose businesses were going backwards in the same industries as our clients that were going forwards. Mm. And the sheer difference was not the product or service. There may have been some differences there, but it was the mindset, how they entered that experience. Yeah, and, and how they were entering that marketing conversation because it's kind of like the unwritten rule that in marketing you want to talk to the conversation that's going on in your in prospect's head. head. Yeah. And that was the thing that changed. It wasn't the product or the service or the value that it delivered. It was the conversation that was going on in that person's, 100%. that yeah, buyer's 100%. head. You know, and all of a sudden we'd gone from like this Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of thing where it was like, you know, growth and survival and, and prestige right down to the bottom of fundamental, like I need to feel safe. I need to feel secure. I need to know where my food, shelter, love is Toilet coming paper, from. paper, some sandy, yeah. cans yeah. of baked beans. But the conversation was what changed, not, not, the, not the product or the service or the offering. Absolutely. Now, this is the thing too, like I was recently listening to one of Jay Abraham's uh, audio books. I'll get the name of it up here. Um, but he was talking about how the fact like he just like rubs his hands together anytime there's anything. It's called the sticking point solution from Jay Abraham. Anytime there is a financial recession or a crisis because it, it breaks most weak business owners. You know, most business owners go into survival mode and the moment they go into survival mode, their brains can't think of solutions. They can't think or can't see opportunities, which leaves more of the taking for those that have got a strong mindset. And this is why... I just think, and I speak so much in, in my book around the psychology of, of business owners and why the psychology is way more important than strategy, you mm -hmm. know, throughout that process. Uh, Jill from Sydney says, uh, Sammy, if you were to coach or mentor someone, how do you establish trust with someone who seems skeptical with coaching? Yeah. Um, people do business with people. Um, and they don't, you know, like, yes, there might be a brand or a container that sits around a business, but ultimately people buy from people and they yeah. do business with people. Uh, so I think 
to get a buy-in for, for someone who's, um, you know, a bit resistant to coaching, there's a reason why. And it yeah. either is like you, that the way that you've shown up isn't right for them, but they need to know you, like you, trust you, but they also need to believe that you can, you can get them the results, but that not only that, but that the, that method or that process will work for them. So they need to believe that you can do it and that they can do it. So if yeah. you can bridge that gap, that's that's where the opportunity for a coaching or a mentoring relationship can can start. Otherwise, it's just way too hard. From a from a, I remember early on in my coaching career, like having clients like that, and it was just way too hard from a coaching perspective. Like I had to do way too much of the heavy lifting, and my clients never got as good a result as they could have because they didn't believe that they could do it. You mm. know, there there was an uneven uneven match in there, and I guess. I'd love to use this as a segue into discussing around relationships and, you know, relationships in business, relationships between each other. I think it's a bit of a hot topic. Um, I recorded some content on during COVID because obviously people were spending a lot more time than they probably used to around their significant other, mm. which is creating a lot of friction. Um, and I think it ties in nicely to a lot of what we relate to in business as well around values. Like Jurist that I spoke to this morning, they have core values in their relationship. They have core values as a family that they align to. And that's how they operate their family very, very successfully mm. uh, as well. But, but Sammy, I'd love to, to jump into that. If you've joined us live, welcome. Uh, please put your questions below wherever you're watching this from. And uh, my team can feed it through to us here. Hit the like button. Let us know that you're loving the chat with Sammy. So relationship, Sammy. Yeah. What, what do you think is the biggest challenge uh you know couples have in relationship in, in in building and growing a thriving relationship um i i mean i think there's heaps and i think they show up differently for different couples but i think the like the fundamentals are the same and i think they're really similar in you know in personal relationships or relationships in like in the workplace or with your team like about having you know a really strong yeah like you said set of values that you both have alignment to you know no matter if you've got um, one person who's got three or four core values that they live and breathe and sh that's how they show up every day and you've got another person who's got, you know, values that are really, really important to them and then when you try and bring them together, they are like magnets, you're going to fight an uphill battle the whole duration of that relationship. So if you can figure out what the shared or the overlap of core values are, I think that helps, I guess, helps give you a, a pathway for that relationship to figure everything else out. But if there's that not a fundamental, um, you know, if there's a fundamental values gap where someone really, really, really values up here and the other person's here, like you're going to struggle to to achieve much in terms of having a vision for where your life wants to go, being able to have constructive conversations, you know, whether or not it's like, giving each other feedback or opportunities for growth, you know, it, that's, I think that's where it starts is having shared core values and knowing what they are and why someone's, why something's important to someone. Yeah. And having them alive in the relationship as well, not just knowing what they are, but, but constantly yeah, living and breathing them every day, every week to, yeah. to keep in alignment there because you can have different values, but you've got to understand how, you know, your partner's values align with your values or vice versa. They don't have to be the same values. Mm. So you need to be able to understand the synergy between the two and that's how you're going to thrive as a relationship. Yeah. Sorry, you go. No, I was going to say, I, I would flip around and show you. I've got, literally got mine and Nath on the wall um, here. Nath is my husband. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got like, you know, love and connection is a core value of ours and wholehearted living, which is about that, um, authenticity and and really showing up and that we make a commitment that if we've got to have an awkward conversation we want to live wholeheartedly so we're going to have the awkward conversation so yeah, yeah it just it's nice to think about and reflect on but yeah live it every day as well yeah. you know what another one that we have is is fun and it's like okay cool if we have to go grocery shopping that's a mundane kind of thing to do but how can we make it a bit more fun are we going to make a game are we going to yeah could think of so many things. <laughs> um, how important is vulnerability in relationships, do you feel? Um, it's, it's funny because I feel like I've said this word probably more times in the last five years of my life than I'd ever said it before or even really understood it as a, a concept or what, what it really means. And I think 
what we had we had uh, the podcast that we dropped today um we had a couple who have been together they met as teenagers and now they're adults and they've got kids and you know they they talked about having no taboo topics and to have no taboo topics means that you have to have this full spectrum of your relationship that there's no blackout areas there's no no go zones that it's full open honest vulnerability and i think you can't have that in a relationship unless you've built kind of, I guess, some psychological safety with one another that, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to then use that information to hurt you or to hinder you or to leave you um, or like for it to come back and be something that I push below the belt on that thing that you've opened up. So I think you can't get to that space of psychological safety and that circle of safety with each other unless someone's been willing to get vulnerable and Mm. then you can't but you also can't have it if you don't do that so I think vulnerability is like if if, you know I don't want to say everything but it's you the the depth of your relationship is going to be so inhibited if either of you have got stuff on the table that's not that you're not acknowledging yeah because I feel it's it's felt within the energetic relationship too. And the way that it's felt is uh, that they're hiding something from me. And because of all the insecurities that we grow up with, all our past Mm. behavioral patterns and belief systems, we naturally make it about us. We naturally believe that something's terribly off when in actual fact, it could just be their own wounding they're carrying around with. And I think this is where, you know, relationships have such a beautiful and amazing opportunity for us to transform as, as human, as spiritual beings as well to address all that unresolved shit, to address all those past patternings that we've been carrying around with for so mm. long because relationships tend to bring to the surface. But I think yeah. so often, I think so often we just push them back down because it hurts or we don't want to deal with it or we think it's not important or, you know. Well, you don't stuff. get curious about it. You know, if someone, if your partner's like pissed you off or annoyed you or hurt you or something that they've done is like really triggered something in you. I think often we don't then take that as an opportunity to actually go in and go, well, why has that upset me so much? What was it about the the thing that they did or didn't do that has caused this reaction? Like, you know, am I feeling excluded? Am I feeling like, you know, they don't really love me? Why is that? Like, what is it, what is it in this situation that's me? Like yeah. what? Yeah. And I think that that's not something that I don't think we're taught. I don't think we're taught to mirror or reflect our own behavior and go, okay, what's going on here? What is yeah. that? Why is that showing up like that? Um, that's definitely a skill that I've learned, like, you know, probably a, a decade too late, <laughs> you know, well, not too late, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it would have been beneficial to learn it a lot sooner for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's I guess it's it's taking radical responsibility for your emotions. Mm. And it's very easy for us to blame someone else. Like something gets said, you say something to me, I get triggered. It's very easy to blame you because I'm triggered. Yeah. But the reality is is it's not so much what you said, it's the way that I've interpreted my response to it or my past patterning or woundings that's caused the trigger in me. Yeah. Yeah, or what's the meaning that I've wrapped around that behavior or that, you know, that action or inaction like what did they do or say versus what is the meaning that I've attached to what they did or said? Absolutely. Which, which then creates the trigger. And I think you're right. If we're able to look at the trigger with curiosity and go, cool, like, like what was it about what Sammy said that caused me to feel this way? And what's behind that feeling? Mm. Like, is my safety in jeopardy? Uh, is my sense of belonging not there? Like what it will typically come down to safety, belonging, or a sense of love and connection that's being mm. threatened in anything if we choose to, to question it. But the beautiful well, thing that is- Well, that worthiness, right? Like that being enough. Yeah, absolutely. And once we start to question it, we start to kind of expand our patterning around that situation. Whereas next time we're not as triggered by it, if, if at all, because we've well, got- If we've done out. the work though. Yeah. Like you can acknowledge it and be aware of it, but unless you've then gone, okay, well, how would I like to address that next time that, you know, what was, what did I do well in that situation? What was the opportunity in that situation? Unless you do that bit, like you can acknowledge it, but unless you do the next stage of actually working on it, it will just keep showing up until you learn that lesson. Yeah. What, what do you feel are some practical things that couples can do? Like at any stage of the relationship right now, like let's just say that they're not quite feeling as connected 
as they'd yeah. like to, or that they're just even aware, like, oh, my relationships hit a bit, a bit of a bit of a plateau. Um, like, I love this man, love this woman, got kids to them, whatever the case may be. But but how do I how do I start to take some positive steps forwards? So, uh, I mean, I'm just going to share something from my own relationship. I Nathan and I have a monthly meeting. Um, yeah, I know, super super A type personality. I, um, speaking my language, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, for us, that creates a really clean dedicated you know predictable space to what's coming up in the next 60 you know 30 60 days what do we need to be prepared for some of it's housekeeping you know what's kind of happened in the last um last 30 days that went well what you know what do we need to work on what's um what are we grateful for what with what support with the highlights and then you know where where are the gaps like where are we now versus where do we want to be it highlights that gap. Um, And for us, that just creates a really strong alignment that we both feel like we're in the same place at the same time, going in the same direction. So if there's not opportunities to do that in your relationship, I feel like you can feel a bit lost. You can feel a bit like, oh, you're kind of going in that direction. I'm kind of going that direction. Hopefully together we're going somewhere in there. But I think without that real like stop, prop, checkpoint, are we on track? Are we not on track? Where mm. are we going? Um, so for us, that works really well. Yeah. What's been the impact of your relationship like since you guys have been running that that monthly kind of meeting? I feel you could sex sexify the name a little bit better just to. Yeah, just, I know it probably needs a cute. Just well, to bring well, a bit we, more inspiration. We have our like annual annual like planning day, and we call it the annual game plan, the AGP. Yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe the monthly meeting needs a sexier name. Yeah. yeah. To a lot <laughs> better. Next time we chat, I'll have, I'll have a All cute right. nickname for it. Yeah, do that. Um, but how long have we been doing it? I mean, Nathan and I got married in 2012. Um, and at that point we'd been together for five years. So I don't know, I think we're like 12, 13 years in. Wow. And I reckon we've been doing the same page, um, kind of meeting, monthly meeting, probably for two and a half years, maybe three years. Um, and I can't imagine not having it now. I like, reckon you instigated, didn't you? Yeah, yeah of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also, I also have a my my husband's an engineer, so he's process driven human being as well. Um, so he likes the agenda, he likes the structure, um, he likes it being in the calendar. He definitely wouldn't instigate it going in the calendar, but he likes that it's there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine not having it because it means that we get to have a dedicated space for housekeeping chat and logistics chat and, you know, that opportunity for growth and feedback um, as well, like asking, how am I doing as your housemate? How am I doing as your lover? How am I doing as your friend? How am I doing as your, you know, like, us on this rocket ship of future together like do you feel like I'm contributing in the way that you would expect and have those conversations and there's a you know if you don't monitor and measure things they just kind of fall off the the priorities list all the time and I can't you know this is our life like what is what's more important than our life like yeah yeah. so I like what's the impact I it's everything like it, yeah. it, you know, creating that space to have those conversations for us is, is so important. And in the months where we've, you know, had to jiggle it and it's had to go two weeks left or two weeks right because of just the, what, what's going on in our world. Like I feel it and I feel like, Oh, we need to have a chat because everything feels a bit disconnected or you're on a, it feels like you're starting to get on a different page than me and, um, yeah, I definitely, for us, it works a trait. Yeah. I, I could almost imagine that maybe, um, some of the, the guys and girls that are watching this are like, oh, that seems like so structured, like so business <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and maybe it does, but I guess like, what is it worth to see your relationship succeed mm. and what's it worth for it not to like divorce is a bloody expensive and consume a shitload of time, energy, effort, and money. Um, and you know, the same principles to build a, like if you've ever been involved in a phenomenal business that has like amazing culture, like imagine that in your intimate relationships, but like tenfold because yeah. there's a sexual polarity and connection there from that level of intimacy as well. It's like those principles work for business. And although we're not saying, Hey, like you should have a 
you know, 15 minute huddle every morning and things like that. I think some basic structure and some feedback loops to have those conversations, mm. to clear the air, to make sure that like anything that's not expressed in relationships builds as resentment. And it builds yeah. up and see how people get 20 years, 30 years in a relationship and one leaves and the other ones had no idea that anything was going on because it was never discussed. And it got to the point where you just stopped kind of feeling that there was something in the air. You became used to it. You, you became kind of conditioned to it. Uh, and then wonder why your, your relationship's gone down to shit. Yeah. And I think like, I don't know what the actual divorce rate is, but it's not even the divorce rate, right? Like you can't say that every married person is in a healthy, happy, thriving relationship. So the God, divorce no. rate is only one measure. That's, that's where two people have you know, actively chosen to exit that relationship publicly. Like doesn't mean that they haven't there's, like there's exited the roommates. relationship and they're still in it. Yeah. M- so many little roommates. I don't know, but like for, for us that carving out that little bit of time each month to do that, it's the same as like a sports team having a rhythm around their training schedule before a game. Like there's no, there's no team that performs well without, with all of the players just doing whatever they want, whenever they want, yeah. like there needs to be an opportunity to regroup and, you know, actively work on, on things and have those conversations. So yeah. for us, that works well, but I, yeah, also I'm aware that like not everybody runs a super clean calendar to, to make that kind of um, cadence or commitment, but I definitely would recommend it in some, that kind of thing in some shape or form. Yeah. And it could be too, like if you're your parents with kids, it's like hiring a babysitter once a month or once mm. a fortnight to go on a mm. date like just to remember what it was like before kids and responsibilities and everything else like that um, as well. So fantastic. So uh, a couple of questions I got. First sure. one, I've been asking a lot of the guests, which is really interesting to hear the answers. If you were to have a conversation with 10 year old version of you, 10 year old Sammy, uh, knowing what you know now, what mm. would you kind of, what advice would you give her? So at 10 years old, what's that? That's like late primary school. I, yeah. um, I'd i probably tell myself that you will find your people. Like yeah. you, I know you feel like you don't belong right now, but they're coming and they are the people that you bring into your world are worth the wait. Yeah. Like, and, and they make all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. And I think it touches on what we said before is, is if you want to fast track that, it's like be more okay with who you are mm. and find a way to love yourself in a deeper, meaningful way. And, you know, others will show up to reflect that. Um, I had a question here from Jim, and I've absolutely got an answer for this. And I'm sure you would too. Jim from Melbourne. Uh, for Sammy, can introverts be effective team players and leaders? Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes more so than extroverts. Um, I mean, I think there's like, obviously teams benefit from having both types, extroverts, introverts, but I think introverts can make great leaders because they often um, are quite considered, like in terms of that they don't have that extrovert need to jump out in front and say the thing or do the thing or get the limelight. So sometimes when they do step into that, place and they're saying something people listen because they're not that you know out of the um the dialogue or the conversation sometimes they're not it's quality not quantity i guess um well that's just my yeah my experience yeah um i I would say absolutely uh believe it or not i'm a hardcore introvert um which Mm -hmm. a lot of people wouldn't realize uh i didn't realize myself i always thought i was extrovert because i loved being around people and people energized me or so i thought but I wondered why after the end of like a two or three day event that we'd run, like I'd just be an emotional shattered. wreck and just shattered and need so <laughs> yeah. much space. And it was once I started to work through different personality profiling tools like Myers-Briggs, uh, DISC and so forth. What I found is that I was more introverted than extroverted. Like I, I kind of sit in the middle a little bit, but I'm definitely more introverted than extroverted. I can do the whole this thing, but it also cooks me. Like it takes a lot out of me as well. So mm. I think regardless of introverted, extroverted, like you know, everybody has the ability to be a great leader. And everyone has the ability to be a great team player. Whether they choose to be or not is another thing. And I think what prevents them from being a good team player or leader is the, sh- the unresolved shit they're carrying around within them from their childhood and from their experiences growing up. I think that's what prevents people from being great team players and great leaders, not whether they're introvert, extrovert, whether they're a, a D-type personality or an S-type personality. I think that's irrelevant. 
Yeah, and they were all those personality types all have, um, you know, strengths. So somebody who's really um, relationship driven as a leader looks very, very different than, you know, someone who's strong strategy leader, like, but they all, they all have their place and, you know, not, not every leader is great at every part. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Thanks for your questions, guys uh, and gals as well. Really appreciate it. If you've got any further ones, put them in the comments below. We'll do our best to get them answered. Uh, Also hit the like button. Let us know that you're loving the conversation. Uh, So, Semi, if people want to connect with you a little bit more, find a bit more about the Fuel Collective, uh, the amazing work you're doing in the relationship space or conversation around that that, that integrated visionary type role, Mm. how can they find you? Uh, So on Instagram, I'm Sammy somewhere. Uh, the podcast that we launched was, is called the date forever podcast and it's about dating both yourself and your partner for forever um, so yeah you could, we're on all the all the normal potty platform um, spaces Spotify Apple podcasts all of that um, yeah. but the fuel collective website is fuelcollective.com.au yeah and thank you for sharing that and uh, we'll put a link below here in the comment section too for you guys make it super easy um, what's the plans for you over the next kind of three to three to five years? Mm, three to five years. I think we can talk three because five feels like too long. But I don't know. I I really love I love hanging out with business owners. I love having conversations about relationships. I love um, using these guys over here, the United Nations Global Goals, as um, a vehicle to encourage other people to use their businesses as, you know, a vehicle for more than making money and and doing some good in the world. Yeah. So it'll be a, a you know a melting pot of those kind of three things: is business, relationships, and contribution. I love that business relationship contribution, and you're doing some phenomenal work uh, as Thank well, you. and certainly see you making a huge impact. And uh, if you want to find out more about the Global Goals, uh, previous episode with Paul Dunn uh, from B1G1 on the live stream series of the Comeback Game podcast as well. Uh, amazing, amazing man with a big heart and mm. uh, just such a delight to hang around with and listen to um, as well. And if, look, if you're currently a business owner, entrepreneur, and you're looking to create a, a profitable, purpose-driven business that can work without you, uh, click on the link we put down below, start to date with the live stream series uh, and get to interact with more amazing guests like uh, Sammy, many others we've had on so far over the next few weeks in the lead up to my launch of my new book, The Path to Freedom, which is the last 18 years of my experience building and growing great companies. Uh, I'm just so, can you tell I'm so over the moon to get this yeah. thing out? Yeah, uh, and so you, so you should be, right? So it's a big deal to take what's in your brain and put it on paper and give it to the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's interesting. I feel very proud around the effort and that's something I never would have experienced about myself in the past. Cause it's like, Oh, what will people think? Or what's the ego there? And it's like, no, like I'm damn proud of myself for going through that process. Not just the last 18 years of my life, the last 40, you know, 34 years of my life, but more so the last four months is laying down that 85, 90,000 words uh, into a book that I just know is going to make such an impact to people that read it because I just see so many people out there in the marketplace with, um, contradictive messages around what you should be doing in business. And I think yeah. that business owners, although we've got access to more information now, I think that they're more confused now than what they were 10 years ago. Uh, and they're desperate to grow great businesses. And I think that businesses have the ability to change the world. Um, so I think more people that can get the simplistic approach to growing businesses with the right psychology, uh, the world's going to be absolutely a better place. Uh, Sammy, thank you so much for your time that I really appreciated having you on board. Everything you've shared. Thanks for having me. Uh, love the support. If you want to reach out to Sammy, we'll put the links below, connect in with her, follow our podcast, the date forever podcast as well. Sammy, look forward to seeing the next one. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me and congrats on the book. I think I can't wait to read it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in today as well, either live or on the replay. Uh, appreciate you. Lots of love from me and look forward to connecting again soon.